My message ceased for like a year. So we're just running from pillar to post, health centers, government owned hospitals, trying to find out why it was that way, but nobody could tell us what the problem was. It's funny when I see women that are waiting, you kind of recognize it in their eyes because it's, it's, it's like a missing light. Went to the hospital, they did a scan and, you know, there they said, oh, it looked like, you know, the pregnancy is threatened, so would advise you to be on bed rest. IVF is not really, I don't find it, you know, I don't have an issue with IVF um, because I believe that um, God puts treatment and medicine in the minds of humans to be able to, um, to be able to um, achieve certain things. Like for example, if someone has cancer, they go through chemotherapy. If you're having complications when you want to have a baby and you can't push out like a Hebrew, you know, woman, you do a C-section, you know, and if you have issues, you know, fertility challenges, you go through treatment if you have to. If you don't have to, I definitely, would never even advise it, not even just because of anything, but for the fact that it's such a difficult road to um, take. You know, it is heartbreaking. Um, it is financially, like, disheartening. Um, my husband and I didn't really have funds when we started our um, journey of treatment. So for us, <laughs> not having money, and having to do a treatment was like a nightmare. Like I remember when my doctor told me um, that I had to do IVF, right? I was in the car. I think I cried for maybe like two hours straight. And then after two hours, I started ginger in my head. I was like, okay, you know what, yeah, Tadi, um, financially, you know how things are. Your husband does not really have money. You know, you can't panic too much. You can't make, you can't be too scared about this part. You have to be strong. You know, so, because um, he is a typical guy, he's a typical Nigerian guy, you know, very, very private, he believes everything is meant to go in a certain way, so treatment was far off, like, I was so scared about what he would think because he just believes that things are meant to happen in a certain way, you know, so um, when I got home, you know, and for him, he had the stress of we were in business together, which was an issue, so um, he had the stress of having to first look after his home, you know, financially. So um, looking for funds for treatment was really not the kind of pressure I wanted to put on him. So um, I told him about it. I didn't want him to panic. I didn't want him to get stressed. I just told him, oh, yeah, I even played it down, like, oh, yeah, you know, we have to do treatment, you know, and he was like, eh. Hey treatment care and I was like ah yes yeah, so uh, we have to do uh, this uh, IVF it was like ah, IVF and because I was so kind of like cool about it he just fed off you know my emotions and he became cool about it and I was like Tade how are we going to afford this and I was like don't worry don't worry about anything you know just um just focus on business and everything don't worry I'll sort it out and when I spoke to him, you know, I was so strong, you know, um, discussing any fertility thing with him. Obviously, there were some times I broke down, but for the most part, I was very strong um, because I knew that he, f he fed off my energy. And if I was weak or I panicked, oh my goodness, he would like, <laughs> he would take that, you know, panic mode and multiply it times 10 and he would just be like a nervous wreck so I really really tried as much as possible to 
protect him and protect his emotions. And in return, I think it was very, very straightforward in terms of our emotional state. But for me, it was really, really heartbreaking. Like, I wouldn't even lie. There were so many days I would cry and cry and cry and cry because it just didn't make sense to me. It didn't, I didn't understand that. Like, all your life is like they tell you that, oh, you're meant to, you know, give birth to children, you know. And I've always had to work hard for every single thing that I had. I've never had things handed to me on a platter of gold. But one thing I knew, what I thought I knew, was childbearing is one of the greatest gifts you could ever have that is free. And it was something that I didn't even have to, well, it was something that I thought I didn't have to, you know, work hard for, that is just a gift that is given to, you know, women. And I held on to that gift because I really wanted it. And something that was meant to be free, you know, what I ended up experiencing was so far from being free in every way possible and I think that was actually my biggest concern the fact that that one thing I couldn't have it for free and I had to use such a long and difficult route to get there but you know what yeah, at the end of the day I was just the kind of person that I wasn't going to be Debbie Downer like oh be sad why me why me you know obviously I cried like that is just normal but when I had to do something I just focused and I think that's what really helped me I just had this tunnel vision like Taddy what do you want you want a baby is this the avenue yes it's the avenue so just look at the end goal so for every single time I saw a needle um, I saw I just looked straight ahead of me and that was the baby and I was like, you know what, I just need to take steps towards getting there and that is, I think, what um, carried me through. Obviously, my husband was just so amazing, like, he protected me so much. We didn't even tell our family, you know, we didn't tell, well, we didn't tell family because I didn't want his own family to judge me. I didn't want them to start psychoanalyzing every single thing that I've done or if I didn't um, if I didn't do this hey, why would not you go through that because you know I didn't want to be constantly judged I didn't want or if I want to go out eh, you that you can't you are busy going out up and down or if I want to do business or you won't focus I didn't want that pressure and he didn't even want that pressure from me so um, he really really tried to protect me as much and I really really love that about him you know anybody that gives him any headache eh, how far how far he would just say that hey we're not ready yet you know and then obviously nigerians hate that statement they're not ready so they now give him a headache like what do you mean you're not ready and then he just took the fight for me and he just like he was like she's not ready we're not ready you know and stuff and we just want to focus on business so um i think that kind of like gave me time to just be in my own zone and just try and focus on, you know, the mountain that was in front of me and just pray to God that I get to the other side. Um, so that's more or less um, what it was. Um, my first treatment of um, IVF, it was, I don't know. I don't know how to describe how it was because I don't think I actually thought about how it was. Like, I didn't want to think. You know when you just want to move on, you don't want to think. So I don't know whether it was difficult, whether it wasn't. All I knew was that I had to do this. And um, my husband and I couldn't obviously afford the treatment. So we had to borrow money to um, pay for the treatment. And that put so much pressure for me. For the treatment to work and for me to get pregnant because that would make sense so when i'm paying back you know i have this bundle of joy so it makes it will make everything all worth it so i just really really focused and um so the the cycle went well and um i ended up actually overstimulating and i dealt with ohss uh so my tummy was looking like a calabash I had a drain attached to me and 
it was really really it was really hard because I couldn't stand up I couldn't move I couldn't do anything I felt so sick but you see when I knew what could have come what could come at the end I just I wasn't sad like I was just so happy that I had it you know I had a chance to you know have a baby so I didn't really focus on all the negative now you know in the middle of the OHSS, they had to tell me whether I was pregnant or not. And then they basically told me that I was pregnant. And obviously, you can imagine, I was like over the moon. And then they told me I was pregnant with twins. I was not like, hey, okay, so God, is this how you do your stuff? <laughs> like, you know, you make me feel as if that's the end. And then you just give me with more than I even asked for. You know, so I was so over the I was so over the moon to the point where... I was like in this mode where I am going to be pregnant and everybody is going to know I'm pregnant. So when I have, in fact, before I start showing, if I had an event, I would be like, oh, ah, when you're showing it, please give allowance. So, ah, you know me, I'm pregnant. Yeah, I was so happy, you know. And then I remember this day, um, I went for a birthday party and I remember, gosh, I was like ridiculous. I remember saving one outfit like i saved that outfit i was like oh this was the first time everybody was going to see me pregnant so i was like oh my god you know and i wore the outfit and um i went i remember the shades if i remember my lips i wore ruby wool lipstick like red <laughs> oh god i was just so excited and i went for the party i was even late there for the party but i went there and um I think probably like an hour into the party, I, at this point I was like eight weeks, eight weeks um, pregnant, an hour into the party I started like, I started bleeding and um, I didn't even know I was bleeding, I just went to the toilet and boom, you're bleeding. But you see the thing is, what you hear is just light spotting, right? This one was mega. Like I was, it was so bad. It was like I was having, it was like I was having a period that I won't stop. So um, immediately I got rushed to um, the hospital. Um, I honestly thought I was having a miscarriage at this point. I went to the hospital. They were like, "Oh, you're not having a miscarriage." I was like, "So what is causing this? Because this is not normal. Me, I know it's not normal." And they're like, "They don't know what is causing it, but I'm bleeding." So they gave me some shots, you know, and stuff, and they more or less put me on bed rest. But you see, at that point, I think that was when the pregnancy from me took a turn. IVF is, is, is often seen as an end-of-the-road treatment. And um, uh, oftentimes, by the time the woman, a couple uh, access IVF, they have done several other things, both orthodox and un unorthodox. And uh, to some, when you say, for those that come earlier and are told, well, IVF is a solution, there's a mixed reaction. Sometimes it's like, oh, my, my case is so bad that we need, I need IVF. But that's not necessarily the case. So we, uh, we, friend, we spend time counseling couples to make them understand that IVF is not an end of the road disease, uh, end of the road treatment. You can, it may be your first line of treatment, depending on what the underlying cause of your fertility, infertility is. For example, if a young woman of 28 has blocked tubes, then IVF is the only way she's going to get pregnant. She can do, she can do all kinds of unorthodox treatments. They're not going to work because there is no physical uh, way for the sperm and the egg to meet. The first thing that uh, uh, happens to a couple when they um, see a doctor is they need to be evaluated. We need to know why is this couple not uh, achieving a pregnancy. And that involves a number of tests. Tests to check the, sp the sperm count, check, test of ovulation, tests to check whether the tubes are patent, tests to check that the lining of the womb is okay, tests to do uh, some hormonal tests which one will do. Now, at the end of these, this assessment, we would, um, would come to a diagnosis. Now, the diagnosis may be 
um, that the problem was with ovulation, that the woman is not ovulating. Now, if a woman doesn't ovulate, she doesn't release her eggs, she's not going to get pregnant. Now, the treatment for uh, ovulation induction or failure of ovulation is not IVF. Okay? So, there are a simple oral medication, sometimes injections, just to drive the ovary a little harder to uh, um, encourage the ovary to release the eggs. So, the, the, the IVF is not really, it's, not, it's never the first prescription, never the first um, mode of treatment. Um, it's only in situations where um, you have, for example, well, an, an example where IVF would be the first line would be in a couple that have blocked tubes or where the sperm count is extremely low. I'm not sure there's any special preparation for an IVF cycle. An IVF is, uh, is, is a treatment um, which involves um, stimulating the woman to um, grow eggs and, later, and then harvesting the eggs. The preparations will be the same as for any treatment. In other words, you just need to um, live a, have a healthy lifestyle. One of the biggest problems is, uh, with IVF is, is, is stress. It's a stressful access, uh, treatment, both um, emotionally uh, and of course financially. And therefore, the, the, the couple need to be psychologically prepared for that. Um, it's, not, it's not the sort of treatment that you embark on without any preparation. You need to be counseled as to what is, li what is likely to um, uh, which is what it likely to entail and sometimes you may defer starting your treatment until you are psychologically ready. Four years passed, nothing. The fifth year came again, nothing. And that was when um, we had, I met this family friend, a couple, Bumi. Um, fantastic friend, you know, she just took me on a journey as well. Um, and what she said was she had a doctor on the island that she could introduce me to. Before I met Bumi, I'd gone to another hospital and I tried um, the, the doctors called it like an, an assisted bedroom, IUI. I tried that twice. And I remember the first one I did, I just thought to myself, this is it. And my husband's, um, so how it works is my egg and my husband's sperm put together and then put into um, my uterus. And I thought to myself, oh, this is it. If nothing would work, this would work. So I tried that and, you know, went, went away feeling happy that I would come back in two weeks for a pregnancy test that would be positive and you know it was negative i was shattered and i just went away another six months to get my my courage my emotions under control again then went back again to the hospital did it a second time and then it didn't happen and i thought to myself maybe i'm not meant to be a mom and Somebody else asked me, a random friend just said to me, what about IVF? But I thought to myself, if I try IVF and it doesn't work, that means I'm doomed. So in my mind, I, I didn't want to go for an IVF because I thought if it didn't work, then that's the end of it. So the IVF was my last resort and pretty much like a last resort. I kept on postponing and postponing and postponing it. Every time people would call me to talk to me about it, I would just, you know, avoid that part and just generally um, move the conversation along. So I booked an appointment and went in to see the doctor and she put me at, at, you know, at ease. She talked me through the process and I just thought to myself, okay, maybe I should give it a shot. So I told my husband and um, financially we just we, we we looked at what we had and it was it was it was something that we had you know he had been thinking about as well but just didn't say anything and then we waited for a couple of months you know I had, had the funds ready 
and then went back to the hospital. So we did um, the first one, the first um, cycle. And I thought to myself, this is it, you know, took time off work, put my feet up and I did everything right. I bought pineapples, everything they asked us to do. I, 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 the, the, the most traumatic part was the injection. I had the phobia for injections before um, my first cycle. But by the time <laughs> I had to be pricking myself every morning, every night, and you know, I, I don't know how I did it because I was, I don't know, inner strength, I don't know. My husband said he's never seen someone as strong as me. And to me, I didn't think I was that strong. But God just saw me through. Did the, te um, finished everything, did this, the cycle, waited the weeks, the, wait, the week of, the weeks of waiting was the most torturous part of the everything. Then I went to the hospital on the day I was supposed to go for my um, pregnancy test. And... The doctor said, I'm sorry, it didn't work. <sighs> I didn't know whether to cry. I didn't know what to do. Then she started talking. I can't remember what she was saying. I just got up, you know, just walked out of the office. And, you know, my husband came with me. I couldn't even go back to work. I just went back home. I cried and cried and cried. You know, it was like... You know when this is like your last chance and it doesn't work? So I cried and cried and cried. I thought to myself, I don't think I can go through this again. I went to almost all the fertility clinics at the time, uh, in Lagos. One of those, um, they basically, the doctor I met told me that, because I wanted to discuss IUI, which is the insemination. He told me because of the issues that issues I had, the blocked tube and the hormonal issues, the IUI would only take us a little bit further than normal intercourse would, and he advised IVF. I have to state that at this time in 2010, IVF was still a taboo topic. Nobody talked about it. The only reason why I knew as much as I did was I was a member of an online community um, somewhere. But Saying that you were going to do IVF at that time was almost like saying you're on drugs. It wasn't, but nobody talked about it. Even people you knew or you suspected had, had, had it, nobody talked about it. So um, making that decision for I, IVF wasn't an easy one, but because I was already impatient, you know, I wasn't, I was approaching my second year of marriage. I was 33 years old. I was impatient. The pressure I put on myself then was more of personal pressure. I had no pressure from any other person. My husband, on the contrary, was in fact a bit too laid back about it. He didn't, for him, he felt like we had just been married yesterday. He, was, he didn't understand why I was in tears every month, why sometimes I, I, I would just be in the room the whole weekend, I won't come out, why I, I was withdrawing from people. He didn't, he didn't understand why you know, I was um, being so hard on myself. But I was under personal pressure. My in-laws were not giving me pressure. My, my family, of course, were not giving me any pressure. Instead, much support. My friends, well, I have the best friends in the world. Everyone knows that. They, I, I didn't have any pressure from them. It was personal pressure I was putting myself through. And then um, when I was away on vacation that year, 2010, my very good friend had just had a baby in the States. And I followed her to one of the toy stores and I bought um, two toys, um, two Sesame Street toys, one Elmo, one um, Grover. And for me that would be saying, God, I want twins. So those, I, 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 I packed them up and I put them in the bag when I came back. And I told my husband, I was starting IVF. And he was like, why? Why? And when he found out how much it, <sighs> What? One million? What? For what? Why must we do this? But I told him, look, it's for me. You have to do it for me because, you know, I can't um, take this anymore. And me signing up for IVF was me thinking, okay, yes, this is the short banker way for baby. The minute we signed, the minute we paid, 
I don't start counting, calculating. Okay, by July 2011, ah, my babies will be here. When they told me that, were, by this time I found another hospital, a hospital in Ekoi. Um, we'd had a lot of discussions. I was told they're going to transfer three embryos. I was like, yes, my triplets in um, July 2011 are going to be born. I was all signed up for it. Starting the IVF process in actuality and not theoretically was a different thing. When I had to go through the tutorial for the injections, that was when, you know, the penny really dropped that. <laughs> Okay, this is what I'm about to sign up. This is what I'm signing up for. From birth till now, actually, even now, needles scare the living daylight out of me. Getting my blood drawn, I can't see the needle. I'm, I'm walking into the room, I'm telling the technician, I don't want to see your needle. And I'm like this the whole time, giving them my hand like this. I don't do needles. And they told me, not only would I have to do needles, I would have to inject myself. I thought, you people are having a laugh, right? And the nurse talked me through it and the, the tutorial. But when I got home with a bag of meds and I emptied everything on the bed, the needles, bot bottles, that was when I really broke down. That was when I actually saw, wow, wow, this is it. This is, this is the IVF. This is not the IVF on the internet. This is the IVF. And, you know, I had a good cry. I thought, why? What, uh, a lot of people, every, um, you know, um, normal people go through life and don't even have to know about any of this. Why? Why? Why is this us? My husband is worse with needles than I am. So he said, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to just cheer you on from here. But so. I was injecting myself every, every, every day, but my consolation was, okay, yeah, this is the price to pay. This is the price to pay. The baby's July 2011, my, 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 my triplets will be born. This is just the price to pay, no, no problem. Went through the down regulation process. Everything was fine, textbook. Started the stimulation process. I was responding, textbook, perfect. Went for my egg retrieval. And that day, you know, there were many of us for egg retrieval that day, probably about nine women in various states of undress, wearing little white hospital robes, sitting down looking lost. And I just didn't, I just felt sad. It just was an incredibly sad day for me. It was raining, it was such a sad, dour day. I had the egg retrieval. I was told to um, come back in um, three days for the transfer. Which, it, which I did, came home immediately. In fact, no, after the transfer, immediately after the transfer, I got up, I had to do some paperwork, you know, had to go to an account, sign a few things. So I was already walking up and down the stairs like 30, 45 minutes after my embryo transfer. Came home, but I was like convinced, oh my God, this IVF, we have already, you know, my friend was traveling. I told her, you have to buy me maternity outfits. I was, I was sure. Then, towards the end of the two-week wait, I, walked, I went to the bathroom and saw I was spotting. I said, no, this can't be. And I called my husband. He was out. I said, wherever you are, just go to the nearest pharmacy and get me a digital pregnancy test. I didn't want anyone in story. Get me a digital pregnancy test, wherever you are. When he came home, I ran into the bathroom. And the funny thing, during that two-week wait, I'd been having all the symptoms. Like, I was online every day checking how I was supposed to feel every day. Okay, this is um, two days post, three day transfer. Okay, I'm, I'm trying, I'm cramping, or my breasts feel funny. I had everything, so I was on track. And then he comes back with the pregnancy test. I go into the bathroom and I test. Not pregnant. That's what, that's what, that's what flashed on the screen. It felt like my whole life had crumbled. I just went to the room and I laid down. He wanted to talk to me, but I said, you know, I don't want to hear any platitudes right now. Just, I want to be by myself. I went to my room when I was on the internet, false negative pregnancy tests. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm really, it's really positive, but it's too early. But it wasn't too early. It was, 
the right time to test, you know, even though a lot of people get false um, negatives, but when I went to the clinic the next day, um, they took my blood and of course it came out negative. But even the doctor was like, oh no, let's just to give it a while, you're not bleeding yet. So, But I, I, already, I had already um, accepted the fact. And within the next 24 hours, I had a full bleed. But worse for me, because my mom was carried along the whole process, and she followed me for, my, um, for the appointments. She was now the one who was more devastated than I was. I was not I mean, having to you know, console her. Because she also thought, okay, cause as a Catholic, it was hard for my parents, as Catholics, it was hard for my parents to say, okay, yes. It's like we have less I had to assure them that, look, there will be no embryos destroyed. So having come to terms with that, okay, yes, we're going through IVF now. No, failure was not an option for any of us. You know, it wasn't. And because I told a few people, quite, quite a few people outside my immediate circle, I told them. So for the next two weeks, I had to deal with all the how far. Oh, this is how far have you had it? Have you tested? Have you worked? So even after, like, I had to relive it every day. Every day when I tell someone, oh no, it didn't work out, it would take me back again, you know, so I decided pretty early on that, you know what, um, I want to try again um, fairly quickly, I, I don't want to wait too long. Yes, it's expensive, but while I'm still in this frame of mind, let me just, let me just do it. So um, my doctor wanted me to have a, um, to have three bleeds. I'm not going to go into the ugly part of what happened with that clinic after the negative. I think I've written a lot about it on my blog. So I'm not going to go there. Let's just say that I wasn't happy and I, found, I decided to return to my original doctor. The one whom I felt was not as aggressive enough. The one who felt I was ready for IVF at the time. I had to return to him. Tail between my legs. Doctor, I'm back. And this is what I've done. I went here, 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 and I had a cycle. I find a problem, and he asked me questions about the cycle. Um, he already knew that I had the tendency to overstimulate, especially because of my policy ovary. So I was on a more um, intimately, or that the word, I was on a better monitored cycle. But my second cycle, it was like a light bulb, and me had switched off. The excitement wasn't there. My, be my best friend was getting married then, so for me, that's what I was focusing on. The injections for me were like, whatever. In my mind, I was already thinking, okay, if this doesn't work, and we can freeze, and then we can... I wasn't even connected to that cycle at all. I was more, I was more vested emotionally in my friend's wedding. Let's just plan your wedding, Chichi, and let's you know, get this over with. And then my egg retrieval was... She got married on a Thursday. The following Monday was my egg retrieval. And uh, my doctor wanted us to have a two-day transfer. I was not so keen on the two-day transfer because everything I'd read said, oh, the, f the more advanced the embryos, the better. Five-day transfers were supposed to be the optimal. But he insisted that you know, a two-day transfer is what would work. So because I wasn't even so, oh, well, whatever. And for the two-day transfer, and um, I decided this time that I wanted to just go on full bed rest. So I stayed in the hospital. I stayed back after my embryo transfer for a few days, three days. And I went, I went home, I came home. And I was at home for the next two weeks. And I said to myself, I'm not going to wait for the hospital to tell me what I don't know, what, what I know I don't know. I'm going to test, you know, as soon as I'm able to test. So I'd accept a date for myself. This is the date I'm going to test. I think in Nigeria of today, it's getting well because a lot of people know somebody who has done IVF. So I think, I think it's well accepted now, but it also depends on the category of people that you're speaking with. If you go for the well-educated people, they're likely to receive, uh, receive or accept it. Um, Sometimes religion has a factor as well because some people believe that maybe IVF is not natural. I mean, I still see people that say, 
oh if i go through ibf is the baby going to be no is going is the baby going to be normal you know so i think sometimes it's awareness perception and also educational background having said that we know that a lot of uneducated people are quite happy to have to go to IVF. We see it them a lot. So I think that it's the want of the family as well. You know, some people just don't feel that, they still feel that IVF is artificial. So they rather wait for God to answer their prayers before, rather than, rather than go for something that they think is man-made. If somebody is trying to conceive, the first person they will see is their general practitioner who will do a lot of tests just to find out whether there's a problem and can correct some of the problem. If he can't get results, he will send the patient to uh, the general gynecologist who might say, okay, you have a fibroid, you have this cyst, let's remove this or let's give you this medication. If that doesn't work, then they get sent to the IVF specialist because it's meant to be like the last part of call. Now that's in a organized society, that's usually what happened. But in Nigeria it's slightly different because we don't seem to have a well-structured system. So when people are trying to conceive, what they might do is that they might go on the internet and look for fertility clinic. Really from that, the fertility clinics in this part of the world are usually IVF centers. So you might be starting from where you're meant to finish. So you haven't gone through all the parameters of seeing a family physician, seeing a general gynecologist before you go to IVF. So yeah, to answer your question, IVF should not be the starting point. It should be after you've tried very minor things that could have helped. I did the first week, went back the second week for another scan and there they said it didn't look like, um, they couldn't get a heartbeat that so um, it most likely would end up in a miscarriage. So I was given two options to either have um, the evacuation done or wait naturally. So I went home, tried to process it. My husband wasn't around, he was offshore. So I called him, spoke to my parents and everybody was you know, of the opinion that I needed to go for a second opinion. I went to the, another hospital and um, there they got a faint heartbeat. So they said, okay, why don't you wait another week since you know, that yes, it's quite low for the stage. Cause then I think I was about eight weeks that is a bit too low but you know they've seen miracles happen that just go home again one more week on bed rest then come and we'll see the cramps kept on you know i kept having a lot of pains but i wasn't bleeding so i just you know thought okay maybe this is just a different pregnancy so when i went home that week on bed rest then i started sporting and um while sporting it wasn't major because I spotted a bit during my son's pregnancy but it was a lot lighter than this was. So I went back to the hospital and then they did a scan and they said, oh, you know, they were sorry that it looked like um, that was the end of the road. So they decided on like the first hospital to induce the um, miscarriage. So they said they would give me drugs which will help me expel them and expel, sorry, the pregnancy and I'll be good to go. So we had the drugs inserted and um, I actually started having the miscarriage even before I go home. So it was quite traumatic for me because I was in the car and I started bleeding. And it wasn't just small bleeding, it was a lot of blood. I'll never forget where I was. I was around a co hotel and I was wet. And I had to use my pashmina, you know, put it all around. I was wet. So imagine the driver, because of course I, wasn't be I was being driven. So the whole back seat was wet. So I was confused because I was wondering that if, you know, it was going to happen this soon, naturally, then why didn't they just leave me to? allow nature to take its course. Anyway, I got home, went up the stairs, bled all the way up, and um, 
and I rushed to the toilet and a lot of it came out and yeah it was sad I cried at this time I couldn't get my husband so I was like practically alone my sister was at work I called her she was on the phone with me you know encouraging me then I went to bed um, then I think that day I think it was just cramps and that was it so then that night my sister came over she slept with me on my bed and um, I woke up at night to go to the toilet and you know it kept coming it was so painful and it was just so much a lot of cloth and you know in, in fact when I looked into the toilet I was wondering this come out of me you know so I expelled a lot of it so I thought okay this is it the worst is over and the next day putting the drugs again nothing much came out I was just bleeding but you know the main gush I had had on the main day fast forward a week later I went back for the scan where they'll check to know how far and um, no actually sorry I went back on the third day when I got back on the third day they checked and said the sack was still there but it had reduced to about maybe five weeks that so continue with the drugs and um, come back in the week but they're sure by then it will be over so I kept inserting because you insert the drugs in you right so I kept inserting the drugs in and nothing was happening anymore so went back the next week the week they told me to come back like maybe four days after the third day so a week from the beginning from the actual initiation of the miscarriage and um, and the sack remained so they put me back on drugs again and said okay you would have to take them a bit longer and um, hopefully it will come out nothing happened I got impatient, I was bored at home and I was sad so I decided to go back to work even though they had said you know you need to be at home because you don't know when it will happen but I just went back in and that whole week nothing happened so I went to the hospital again and they tried to convince me to take drugs again and then I'd had it. I was like no, I've taken these drugs for two weeks now, I'm done that um, I'm, I need to move forward, you know, I can't keep waiting for this thing to drop. So they said, okay, they would have to then do the DNC to take it out. But that usually they prefer to just, you know, give you drugs and it comes out that it's less evasive. But I was like, well, this is where we are. We have to move on. So that happened. So. This miscarriage started in January, right? End of January. I didn't get to do the evacuation proper till first week in February. So went in that day and I thought, okay, you, you know, they'll tell you, tell you not to eat and all that. So I was like, yeah, fine, I'm done. I'm tired of carrying a sack that's not yielding anything in me. So we went in, signed all the docs and went up to do it. And the um, doctor doing it asked me, you know, looked at my file and said, oh, did you have a lot of things come out? I told her the story. Yes, I saw a lot of things, blah, 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 blah. And she said, okay, well, let's see, you know, we'll take out this and we'll have to test to know, you know, what the reason for this miscarriage, you know, and they'll take a bit of samples. And I was like, okay. So they took me in, knocked me out, did whatever, and I woke up in pains, but at least I was happy that, you know, I can move on from there. So um, I had a little bleed after then, but yeah, I was fine. I went back to work, and of course, typical, I was just thinking of counting down the days to try again and get pregnant again, not knowing what the future had in store. After that evacuation, I thought I'd, you know, have a period like regular. I thought maybe two months. It didn't happen. I went back to the hospital and they said, oh, yeah, sometimes it happens, you know, come back again if you don't see the period. So I went back. I had, of course, been online researching. Some people would say two months, some three months. And, you know, I was patient waiting. 
So the third month, I think, I, yeah, my birthday, so me, my birthday month, I went back in, excuse me, and decided to give me um, the birth control pills to hopefully, you know, kickstart the process. And I had that, and I bled that month, and that was it. The next month, it didn't happen again. So I said to myself then that, okay, I'm done. For the last six months, I've been in and out of hospital that I'm done. I'm not going in again. So I didn't go in the whole of June through November. Now in November, I went in because I was sick. I had malaria and typhoid. So I went into the, the hospital. And when I got there, the guy saw me and said, I haven't seen you. And I said, well, I'm on a break. And he said, have you started, you know, your anti flow call. I said, no. He was like, why? Because he had, sorry, he had told me that if it didn't happen again, they would have to put the coil in again. I can't remember what he called it, but different from the copper coil, which I had had initially, and that would help. You know, and that's when they started saying things like, oh, we think you might have, you might have Asherman syndrome. I had never heard of that before. So, I went, of course, as I said it, I was on my phone and I was reading and I found out that, okay, that could happen if you've had like caesarean section, fibroids, or a D and C that, you know, your womb could actually collapse, fuse close together or fuse together. You could have scar tissues, which would not encourage a healthy menstruation. So when I read that and I had seen that, okay, some, there were just several ways of um, treating it. Some you had to go in and remove the scar tissue, some you had to just put in the coil. I accepted. I said, okay, I'm already here. So when I had finished with the blood test and all that for the malaria, I went up to the guy and said, okay, I think I'm ready, you know, let's do this. So there and then they fitted me with the coil and I started a period. So then I started beating myself that, okay, why did you wait so long, you know, if this would have happened faster. Then I had the period that month in November, or was it December? And he said, we'll take it out. I didn't want to take it out. I was like, leave it. <laughs> Maybe I take it out now, it will go away again. He said, no, don't worry, come. So I took it out the next month and I had a period then. So I thought, okay, I was fine. It was time to start, you know, getting this baby business out. So we had gone into 2014 and, um, it wasn't working. Of course, um, my husband's job didn't help because he was one month in, one month, one month off. So it was only when he was around that, you know, we could try. So um, that same doctor had said he would like to see how I was ovulating. So I had to come in for the Clomid test. So I did that, I think, in February. And they were like, oh, it was fine when is your husband around? I said, March. And he said, okay, you come in again in March and let's do it. We did it in March. I was going in every three days or something for a scan. And they'll tell me, oh, you have eggs, follicles here. You know, you have their, okay, they were, you know, advising. They'll tell me when to try. So I think they waited till it grew big enough. And they said, they gave me a window to go and try, you know, and it didn't work. <clears throat> Excuse me, but this time I didn't go back when it didn't work. I was just like, you know, I'm done. I got pregnant naturally the, first, naturally the first time, so I'll wait till whenever this happens. This was 2014, yeah. So it went on the whole year, it didn't happen. Towards the end of the year, I think around September, I said, okay, I need to go see a specialist this time. Let's see, stop going to the regular guy, let's see what's happening. So I went to the doctor, saw, did a lot of tests, and um, well, most of it was fine. In fact, everything was fine except the, um, then the challenge then was oh, the, my result wasn't very nice. You know, the result wasn't very good. It was like, but yeah, you know, let's see how it goes. But you may have to be, you know, you may have to do IVF to help get more a better result and I was like okay I'm actually tired of waiting so no problem we had that cycle and it was made. in fact cycle was cancelled because um, I had um, 
different sizes of eggs growing around the same time so some were very low some were very high so he was just like you know what let's cancel this second you try naturally with what we've done so far and um, we'll try again that didn't work so while waiting for the period after that cycle the period disappeared again so then I went to my regular hospital you know and ran tests and everything looked fine luckily the doctor decided after that test to run another a thyroid test and that's when he said oh your, your thyroid functions are off the charts you have a thyroid condition so then I'd had it I was like why is it like you know you're moving from one issue to another now why can't you just be smooth sailing what's happening you know he referred me to the necrologist I went to see him and he was like oh well um, it happened sometimes that that's probably why you were not having a period you know and I'm like well the reason I wasn't having a period before last year was something else and now this year you're telling me something else that what exactly is going on so he said um, I was lucky it wasn't that bad but you know I'd have to be on drugs for a while and um, he would have to check me regularly before he signs me off to try this is me who is like okay I just want to have my cycles back to back and be done you know I'm not getting any younger I already have this issue you know anyway I started the drugs in February and I think I kept going back for tests every two or three months and um, sometime end of the year this is now 2015 he, this, he said, okay, yeah, you can try, but you'd have to change the drugs when you're trying or, the, or when you've tried to something else because, you know, the drug is not exactly friendly. That, well, it's okay, he has pregnant women taking it, but because you're spending so much money trying to get pregnant, he wouldn't allow, he wouldn't want me to take those drugs. So he would give me another type. So we had said, okay, fine, we'll do that. So I moved hospitals now. So another IVF clinic. So of course, getting there, I had to do all the tests again and all that. Then they had the laparoscopy to check. And he said, oh, your lining was... In fact, he didn't believe when I told him I had had Asherman syndrome. He was like, oh no, that the result doesn't say that. that you know, it looks beautiful. It looks this. Okay. So we tried the cycle. And same thing. He felt my lining just wasn't doing anything. So he says, oh, not a bother, we'll freeze and you'll do a FET, that's the frozen egg transfer this time, that in fact, that would be better. That, that way your lining will be, you know, really nourished and it would be thick enough and all that. Okay, stayed on the drugs, a lot of estrogen, the pumps, there were Viagra, there were so many things. I was particularly in setting and drinking, I was high. I said okay it would work this time and we did and after almost two weeks I think my lining got to five and we were looking to get to eight this is me drinking all the cranberries buying permanganate everything it just wasn't moving at that point he was beginning to of course you know a doctor isn't going to come out and tell you well some will but you know they're like oh no i'm sure we can still do this we can still do that you know but it looked like we we're canceling the cycle again so we did so in 2016 it just looked like the whole year i felt like it was a waste of <laughs> resources time you know that you are I, I really felt very, very low because I was like, why? You know, you're moving. So it now looked like the main issue was actually the lining all along. Not, not any other, you know, that I had probably had this lining issue, which then, you know, he's now suspecting, oh, maybe when you had expelled a lot of the photos, right? Maybe the sack that was left was a bit... Um, was little and when they went into you know do the evacuation maybe a little bit more <laughs> was scraped you know but you know nobody can say so he was like okay well why don't you go on a break again till January you know take a month or two and come back and um, 
I would have done a bit more research, would know what kind of um, you know, things to use, drugs and things that can help build the lining a bit more so that we can transfer the embryos. So that's in a nutshell <laughs> has been my diagnosis. So I have I've had Asherman syndrome and um, now I have I'm battling with thin endometrial lining. For the first time in my life, I sat there with my husband and we're told point blank, you will not be able to have children by yourselves without intervention. I was numb that day because um, first even though I was still groggy from the anesthesia, I thought to myself, this is not the kind of thing that any woman wants to hear. I haven't had a child and then you tell me I can't have a child all by myself. I'm going to need some help and, and everything, you know. And I remember that as I sat in front of him, I just decided that at that period, I said, well, it's no longer what doctors can do for me. It's no longer about what I can do for myself. This is now a God job. And that was the approach that I took. Now, the strangest thing is my husband was in all of this. He, he was distressed. And you know when you, and for him, for coming from a place, not just being a medical doctor, he has a postgraduate degree in assisted reproductive technology. So you have all the book knowledge and you can't help yourself. So he's the one who sits across the table talking to patients, counseling them about what they need to do and everything. And then you're now in a point where you need to take your own advice and it was a bitter pill to swallow. And so for him, it's, it, you know, it's okay. We, they're saying we need to do IVF. How does this play with faith and everything? Maybe we have not tried enough. You know, he was just coming up with all sorts of things. But all I could hear was, I'm not accepting this, you know, reality. I'm not accepting it and everything. So we had a conversation about it. And I said to him, I said, okay, we need to give it a try. That I mean, we're medical doctors. We understand the role of science in what we're looking for, you know, and so we should consider what the doctors have suggested. So we came back, I mean, this was after many months on taking fertility pills and fertility injections. And rather than get pregnant, I was just getting fat and I was getting symptoms like, almost like menopause. Everybody is nice and cool. I'm going to be hot, temperature, I was getting all the hot flushes. Weird symptoms from all the um, hormonal injections and drugs that I was taking. So we decided on, going in to then discuss having the IVF and I remember that the gynecologist had talked us through it and said okay we'll try the IVF first with the fibroids still in place and if it fails then we'll take out the fibroids and then repeat the IVF but that day we left and I just I felt a bit uneasy the hospital and everything and I just said to my husband I said okay I think I want a second opinion say I don't have a problem with everything they said but I would like for somebody else to take a look and to just say this is the right thing to do so we found another gynecologist and um, there I say I just fell in love with him you know when you you know that you found your doctor when you're like at peace and everything so I thought okay it was going to be a good journey for us and then sat in front of him, asked a couple of questions, and then after hearing everything that I'd, I'd been th through, he said, okay, that um, we'll leave the fibroids in place and do the IVF. Now, in the previous hospital I'd gone to, the, the, they couldn't take out the fibroids, but then there was another problem. They said I had cervical polyps, and that was what was contributing to the bleeding. So I actually had surgery to take out the polyps, but the fibroid was still left in, in place. So, um... We did the first IVF and somewhere towards the end of it, I was given um, an injection that was supposed to help me release the eggs so that the eggs can then be collected. And I reacted badly to, to that injection. Um, I think about two days before we were supposed to go for egg collection, I started having some weird feelings in my tummy. First I thought maybe okay, it was indigestion or constipation or one of those things. And then because I used to have ulcer in the past, so I had all sorts of things running in my head. So I was taking drugs for the things that I thought it would be. I didn't realize that something else was, something sinister was going on. The night before we were supposed to go for the egg retrieval, I couldn't sleep. So I, I, I drank half a bottle of Gaviscon trying to induce diarrhea because I thought it was just something in my tummy. But then nothing worked. My appointment was for 3 p.m. the following day. 
but it's because we didn't sleep through the night in the morning i just had a bath and i was like let's go to the hospital and i remember the journey to the hospital then we lived in Yokoi. hospital is in Lekki. and the journey to the hospital even though it was short i remember that we had to do a lot of stops on the road because i actually wasn't comfortable in any position in the car i'll sit at the back i'll go and sit in the front i was adjusting myself it just felt like something was totally off and i just didn't feel comfortable in my own skin so we got to the hospital the nurses were a bit um you know concerned just looking at me because at this point my abdominal girth that's my waistline had gone to 104 so um they did all the checks that they had to do and then they called the doctor and he said okay Apparently, I had um, developed something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And basically, this is um, reacting badly to the injection. So it caused my blood vessels to leak. So I was collecting fluid and blood in my tummy. So um, he went ahead and still did the egg collection and um, all of that. And he said oh, that I was going to, he was still going to do the embryo transfer as well. And everything then I had to be admitted into hospital now the strangest thing is it's a fatal complication and there is no treatment even if I was in Canada I was in America wherever I was in the world the only thing that you could do is try and relieve the symptoms and then just hope for for the best there's really nothing that anybody could do and I remember them the first day in hospital I felt so uncomfortable they propped up my bed I wasn't uncom I wasn't comfortable in any position lying flat lying up and everything and I couldn't eat so they were just giving me loads and loads of fluids trying to replace the fluids I was losing into my belly by the third night I'd, I'd started having problems difficulty with breathing so my tummy had gone so big that it had pushed up my lungs and so I couldn't breathe properly. And that night, um, for the first time in my life, I was scared because it felt like I wasn't going to make it till morning. My husband got the doctor that was on call. I know usually when you're a doctor patient, they tend to think that, okay, you're trying to be, you know, in their faces and to manipulate things. But when I need to be a patient, I'm always a patient. And in this instance, I just, you know, whatever you felt you needed to do, I'm not going to tell you what to do. So he decided, okay, he was going to sedate me to try and get me to sleep. But I wasn't comfortable. So in spite of the injections he gave to get me to sleep, I was still very wide awake. And then um, about 1.30 a.m., it became very uncomfortable. And at that, at that time, I actually thought that I was dying. So I said to my husband, I said, call a pastor. I need for somebody to talk to me. At least if I was going to go, let me just, you know, get everything right and set everything straight. And so he called and she prayed with me. And um, she just said we should continue to pray and all of that. And I remembered in my discomfort and in the fear that gripped me, I just had this peace all of a sudden. And um, a scripture kept coming to my mind that you will pass through the water and it will not overflow you. You pass through the fire and you will not be consumed. So I said to my husband, I said, find that scripture and start to read it out. Because I couldn't breathe, I was uncomfortable. I just told him, I, I muttered the scripture and I said, you should just start to read it out and everything. And it did that until about five o'clock when I fell asleep. Then in the morning, my gynecologist came in and as soon as he walked in and he was like, how are you? Before I could even answer, I said, I can see that you're uncomfortable. And thank God for um, a gynecologist who knows his job. And then um, he's very skilled in ultrasound. So he, he decided that, okay, we'll go in and we'll go and tap this fluid. We'll get it all out. And it, it was his knowledge of ultrasound scan that really came to, to play here. So we went in, he put in a needle and he tapped about three liters of blood and fluid out of my tummy and for the first time in four days i had a bit of relief so the first thing i said i said please give me ogi just give me pap i want to eat because i hadn't I, I couldn't even drink water you know so i had them um, ogi i had a bit of water but um, unfortunately less than two hours after everything was back the fluid had recollected and all of that i had my embryo transfer um, I mean, it was surreal going into the lab and they were showing me all the, yes, you know, like, okay, this one is the grade one that uh, fertilized eggs and all of that. And, you know, just the idea that, oh, I might be staring at my child, you know, I'm looking at my unborn baby kind of thing. It was very surreal, you know, so I thought, okay, this might be it. 
so i still in, in spite of all the discomfort and everything there was still a there was a glimmer of hope you know my first um, ivf circle so when we would, when i got there they were like okay we have to do hysteroscopy i said oh that has already been done it wasn't done by us you need to do no, now I have the results, I have everything. Maybe we could just do a scan to find out if everything was fine in there. I said, no, okay, let's do laparoscopy. I said, okay. Went through the laparoscopy, after the laparoscopy. They said my, my tubes were not patterned, so we had to do hydrotubation. Hydrotubation is where they keep you upside down for like one hour with some fluid injected into your tubes. So you'd be in that position for one hour. After we did that for one hour, then I found out that they didn't even really need to do that because they were going to bypass the tubes anyway for IVF. Time wasted, money wasted. So I had, I had to wait for a month to heal from the laparoscopy and the hydrotubation and all the procedures that were done at, at that time. So after the month passed, we started the injectables, the drugs for the IVF process. After two months of drugs and injectables, my lining didn't come up. So the cycle was cancelled. Cancelled the cycle and I waited another one month again. Started all over again, with injectables again and everything. So I was hoping it was going to work. But I had a dual mindset because I've read that it's a 50 50 thing. But with all the procedures done, I thought I was in good hands, that everything was going, going on fine. So I we went into, we did the egg retrieval. After that, we did the transfer. Two weeks, I was back in the hospital. Negative results. I, di I didn't know how I felt. But since I already knew it was a 50-50 thing, but at some point I was hoping I'll be an exception to the rule. It was going to work for me. It worked for some people for, at the first try. So why was my own different? So after, the, after, the, after I got the result, I was supposed to go for a review. So during the review, the nurse said, because of the scarring, 70% scarring I had, so that they had some bald spots, like some places where the lining would never grow. So for me now, I was kind of like a write-off. It can never happen natural. It has to be true assisted reproductive technology. With that news, I went back home. I was devastated. I didn't know what to think. But the only way to grieve is grief. So I took out time. I grieved. I think, I wouldn't say I'm strong, because I know people stronger than me that has broken that, but I think I, I became more involved in my job. You know, all my energy, everything was just into my job. So I think it helped me. Then I now found the Fertility Group. I saw a lot of women who had, who had worse experiences or worse diagnoses than me, and it also helped me heal. Because it's better when you when you see somebody going through the same thing you're going through. I think you just know that okay, we're in the same boat, so you just have to like brace up and be strong for yourself, if not for anybody. Well, going through the IVF treatment is something that is um, emotionally tasking. It's also financially tasking for some people, spiritually as well, is tasking. So you have to look at all those factors before you prepare for IVF. And in talking about um, preparation, now um, the couple need to be emotionally ready to go through the process because it's as it's up and down. Yes, a lot of women have gotten um, pregnant doing IVF treatment, but there are still people who go through the IVF treatment and don't achieve a pregnancy. And then um, because of the um, our culture, our environment, there are still some little bit of stigmatization attached with the IVF treatment. So in preparing for the IVF treatment, we try to tell couples, especially um, you have to be as healthy as possible. For, for us to achieve um, a certain level of um, success because being overweight or being underweight can impact 
on the success of an IVF one. So for people um, who have um, lifestyle where they smoke a lot or drink a lot, we also counsel about that. We also counsel about weight loss as well or adding weight if um, we see that the person is overweight or underweight. Then we also let them realize that, okay, yes, you need to go through certain medications, injections that to stimulate the ovaries to ensure that we get as many eggs as possible and sometimes this can come with its own side effect as well for for the woman she can have some mood swings because of the hormones she's taking there could be a headache in some cases and there's a chance that okay there could be a um, of um ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome as well although very rare but that's also something that can happen so we just prepare the mind of uh, the couple to let them know okay these are some of the things that could happen while you are going through the ivf treatment as well it's a 50-50 thingy. It depends on um, the scenario where the prescription is coming from because before you can um, prescribe IVF treatment for someone, you need to have done some baseline investigations to ascertain what the cause of the infertility is. And basically for people who have uh, maybe issues with the fallopian tube or if there are issues with the um, significant issues with the sperm cells or you look at the duration of where the couple have been trying for, the age of the woman as well. Those are factors that um, determine what line of treatment you are going to prescribe. And if all those points are explained to the couple in detail, and they understand the reason why they need to do the IVF treatment. For a lot of times, yeah, some have um, some misgivings about the IVF treatment itself because of the stigmatization attached with it, because of the cost in some cases, and because of certain myths that okay, IVF babies maybe have some defect or don't grow well. So, but in in practice, we have been seeing that a lot more people are becoming more comfortable going through the IVF treatment. When we need to prescribe IVF is when maybe there are significant issues with the tubes or sperm or are, um, the number of years they have been trying to get pregnant for is more than three years because studies have shown that for couples who have been trying one year, two years, three years they are not getting pregnant, that there is something significant going on making them not to get pregnant. Then the age of the woman as well because as the woman advances in age, the quality of her eggs and um, the quantity keep diminishing as well. So for women who are older than 35 years who have been trying to achieve a pregnancy and they are not able to and they have been trying for three, four, five years. Yes, IVF is the way to go. So we started the IVF. We started the IVF. And IVF was a bit I had read about it, but they didn't tell you that the injections were not the worst part. You know, that for me the worst part was the emotional roller coaster the injections, the hormonal injections put me on. As in one minute I was crying, the next minute I'm shouting the next minute i'm depressed and it affected me a lot more than i thought that even when the treatment was over and they're like oh you're pregnant i couldn't even find it in me to laugh because i was just in an emotional roller coaster and you know it's it's so by the time i started bleeding in early pregnancy i went into, you know, I went from depressed to full panic mode. And I started, I remember bleeding and lying down and saying, God, please, I'm not sure I can do this again. <laughs> Let me be okay. But I wasn't okay, you know, and um, I had a miscarriage. It was tough because I, I think because I kind of fell into the IVF cycle, I wasn't prepared for that. And then my clinic was awful. Well, they were awful. Let's just leave it at that. They were awful. They were not very supportive. And so I swore off IVF for a while that I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. And then another year rolls by. I kept self-medicating and trying to get pregnant, changing stuff. And so while I was like, you know what, I think I'm just going to enjoy myself. Let me not bother at all. After over a year, in September 2016, we were like, oh, let's try again. And I was like, yeah, I'm trying again, but I'm not going back to that clinic, please. They're not nice. I won't mention they're any more camera, but they were not nice. So, I, I went to another clinic, and these ones were wonderful people. 
and we started the whole cycle again. I, I was this one was different because I think maybe it had to do with the doctors or the clinic. It wasn't, and I think I was also in a better frame of mind. I wasn't that emotional or tense or worried about things. I was more relaxed, and I think it had a lot to do with my faith. I was on another level in my faith journey at this time. So we we started and everything was going well until it was time for us to do the egg retrieval and the doctors were like ah, it looks like you're about to have almost 30 eggs and i was like they have a 30 follicles almost 30 and you know for anyone that's on ivf that's like we're going to cancel this cycle and then we're going to cancel it i was like doctor now should be 30 is the limit let's we are like 27 let's just you know go there let's not cancel it now you know let's just move on and she was like okay well you're not 30 so let's just only for us to get to the egg retrieval and they retrieved 36 eggs and the doctor was in full panic mode like i'm going to have to cancel this cycle and i was like no please don't and she was like no i'm going to but she said you know what i'm going to watch you we'll do a day five transfer let's see i'm not going to transfer early because i think you are prone to ohss ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome i had read about it but you know it's something you just read and you're like it can't be me can't be me, I mean, there's a risk of death, dizziness, fainting, bloated, bloated stomach, oh, no, it can't be me, it can't be me. So, the day of the egg retrieval, the minute we finished, I started vomiting, the doctor was like, see, see, I told you, I'm like, well, it's just a reaction to the epidural, I'll be fine. That was the first day. By day two, it was another story entirely, and my husband traveled on the day of the egg retrieval, so I was alone at home with my staff. And that was when it got really bad. I could not walk. I could not eat. I could not lie down. I could not sit up. In fact, I could just not do anything and be comfortable. By the evening of the second day, of course, that means I could not drive. I was in a terrible state. I think I could very easily have died in my sitting room. It was a terrible time. I couldn't walk. I had to crawl to the bathroom. It's not exactly the best memory when you think about it. Anyway. Well, you know what? I got myself to the clinic very early on the third day. And the doctor was like, you are so lucky you got here on time because you are so dehydrated. We can't even do anything with you. So they had to pass, give me drips for like five for them to be able to do anything because I think my veins were collapsing. I was dehydrated because I vomited and I had diarrhea all night. And the doctor was like, we're so glad you're here. And they had to drain fluid from me and give me a bag that I carried for eight days to drain the fluid from my stomach constantly. I honestly thought I was going to die. But you know what that thing did for me? It changed a lot of stuff. Because it was at that point my faith changed. And I was like, come on, how can I just die like, almost die like a dog in my sitting room? What is this? Because I want to have a child? Is it really that serious? And my husband was of the opinion that, look, I want you, really, I want you. If we have a child, that's fine. If we don't, that's also fine. I don't want you dead. I didn't get married so that I would be alone. I want you. So I think we should just slow down a bit. It took me another six weeks or so to recover for me to go back to work. But during that six weeks, a lot changed. I was calm, calmer than a lot of people thought I would be. My husband especially kept asking, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> and um, it was like, I got closer to God in those few weeks I wasn't working. And a lot changed for me, like I said earlier. That was, I went back to work November 2016, but I, 
What I do now as a minister, I trace it back to that time when I was ill. Because I realized that even when you think you're dying, God is good. Even when what you want the most in the world is not happening, it doesn't change the fact that you have good health, you have a whole lot of other things that money cannot buy. I had my daughter, I have my daughter, I have my husband. I have so many things, so much more than a lot of people have. And I learned gratitude. I learned that the most important thing in the world really is my relationship with God, closely followed by my relationship with my husband and my daughter. I think it was at that point I got free. <laughs> I, I stopped worrying. I, I was like, you know what, this is going to happen. I still have my embryos at the clinic. If I want to at any time, I can go back for my FET. If I want to, nothing is stopping me. But for now, I'm just learning to live and enjoy and do what I like to do, which is be a minister. It was, it was painful to go through. I, like I said, one of my favorite aunties, Auntie Obi, had been trying to have a child for as long as I've, I've known her pretty much all my life. And so when I had my first child, she had taken out her womb at this point, but she had some eggs that she had frozen. And she asked me if I could help her carry the baby and everything. Otherwise, she was going to have to pay somebody else a lot of money to do it then also. At the time I just had my first baby, my first child was about a year and I wasn't planning to have any kid for at least two, three years. So I was like, sure, why not? I ran it by my husband. My husband knows her, he likes her. And then he was cool with it. So I was like, are you sure about it? I said, yes. And then he said, okay, no problem. So we started the first circle. She had about five frozen eggs. Beside the first circle, it was a lot of taking medications, taking drugs, taking your injections, eating right. I was working out. I was doing a lot. I did a lot for that circle. And because getting pregnant for me was easy, I thought that it was going to be easy. I did not expect anything other than the fact that, yes, this was going to happen. And Auntie Elby was finally going to be a mom. She was going to have her own kid. And all, but the first circle failed and none of the embryos stuck and I didn't know why. I was um, 23 at that point. So they tell you, oh, when you're young, you have no issues whatsoever, you're good, you're eating right, everything is going well. And I was under a lot of pressure because I was like our last hope at that point. And, um, if it didn't work for me, it wasn't going to work for her. It was like the weight of everything and the hope of being a mother laid on my shoulders and I tried to make this happen for her. I did everything that I could do. I was monitoring myself like a crazy human being. I was carrying my injection bag everywhere I went because I had to make sure I was taking my injection at the time that the doctor said to take it. I know the first circle failed and the doctor said we should immediately try for the next one. I wanted to wait a bit to see, okay, what went wrong, I know, but my auntie was skeptical about waiting because she felt I was going to change my mind and she didn't want to have me change my mind because if she says, okay, let's take like three months break, I could come back in three months and say, auntie, I've thought about this, so I don't think I can do it and she didn't want that. And so we said, okay, so let's go for the second circle. The second circle went well, um, two babies, two embryos to stab around this stalk. And after the two weeks, we took out um, our pregnancy test positive. And so we're happy. Everybody was overjoyed. My mom was happy because my mom and my aunt had gone on fasting and vigil throughout the entire circle. They were praying for me, praying for the baby and everything. And um, one Sunday evening, about a week after I had gotten the positive, I started feeling cramps. I started cramping. And I went to the hospital that night. I remember my husband driving me to the hospital at about 2 a.m. in the morning. 
and I was just there and then the doctor says what happened I said I don't know I don't know if I ate something I'm allergic to I, I don't know what happened and I was really worried and uh, at about 8 a.m. the pregnancy came down like I felt it I felt it drop I felt them come down and I felt I felt dreams like like it was like a war had started and it was a crazy position to be in. I went into depression because I felt like I disappointed my auntie. First of all, I blamed myself because I thought it was maybe something I'd eaten the previous night that I cursed it and these were the last of our embryos. She didn't have any other one left. There was nothing else we could do at that point in time and I couldn't even talk to her. I, I just sent her a text. And then I called my mom and I switched off my phone. I blanked off for some days. I blanked off for some days. I, it was really hard on me. I don't know, I can't imagine what it must have been like for her, but for me, it was, it was a horrible place to be in because I felt like I disappointed her, her husband, my mom, everybody that I thought that Auntie Abby finally had a chance to be a mother through me. I know that there was no other person in our family that was better positioned to do this actually aside me and so with that ended our dream of carrying our own child or having our own baby. Lots of people are now very enlightened or enlightened before. I mean we've seen a change in trend. I remember years past, I'll say about 10 years ago, it used to be more of a taboo where people don't want to people to know that they are coming to an IVF clinic. Some people go, come through the back into the clinics and things like that. But people are now more educated about it, that they know that it's, it's like any other problem you, might, you may have medically that you need help. And they, they've come to, a lot of people have come to terms with it. And also the general population that do not had the problem also, which who were the people that were always scared of, are now coming to the realization that there's it's not a taboo. There's not not there's no big deal about it. We, I mean, a lot of problems was that doctors were trying to help God and all those things, but people are now overcoming all those um, myths and they know that it is just like any other medical treatment that is necessary. Well, of course, we still have the few that do not want people to know they did IVF. A lot of times before people present in Nigeria, it's sometimes a bit late. And there's no time to start faffing around again. Usually it is said that regardless of the cause of the delay, if you've tried for more than three years and you haven't achieved a pregnancy, then it is best to go straight to IVF. Because IVF bypasses a lot of things that the other um, fertility treatments do not. So rather than faff around and start trying, it is recommended that you go straight to IVF. But in some instances, a couple comes in, they're young, and um, you know that there are obvious things that can be easily corrected, then you don't need to jump to IVF. I mean, such patients we will try. And people with, um, like you know, you cannot find a cause for their infertility, then we would try other means before we go to IVF. But on average, it usually ends up with IVF because of late presentations a lot of times. And then there are real problems a lot of times. IVF can be draining in many ways. They have to, you know, it amazes me when couples come in and they, They've done IVF in different places and they don't know what they did. They're not even sure they did IVF. You wouldn't believe, you pay all that money. And you, they're not quite sure if it was IVF. They don't know the details. They can't give you details. I like us to be on the page. I like my patients and I to be on the same page, to know what it entails because it drains you in all manners, emotionally, financially, physically, and in all. So it is good to have proper understanding of the procedure before you start. And to know that this procedure is not 100%, so you are geared up. But by the time we try for about three times, you should achieve a pregnancy. 
that is not to say you can achieve it the first time, but on average, you need to try more than the ones to achieve a pregnancy. So they need to know that beforehand. They need to know what it entail, entails physically. The taking of injections every day for up to sometimes two to three, four weeks. And, um, and of course, you know, IVF can be financially draining. So it is good to have understand. You're able to deal with things that you have perfect understanding of beforehand. So that is one thing I, I believe all IVF patients need to know before they go into it. And also to find out about the clinic they're going to. What are their pregnancy rates? What sort of support do they have in terms of emotional support, counseling and things? And also, sometimes IVF develops complications. Do they have, what's the percentage of this complication? Um, they need to find out what um, the percentage of the complications they have are and how they deal with it. So those are good things to, and there are pregnancy rates, of course. You just don't walk into any IVF clinic and say you want to do IVF. It's good to find out those things.